name is Kirby Dunn. I'm the executive director of Home Share Vermont, and I'm also the board president of the National Shared Housing Resource Center. And the National Shared Housing Resource Center is a co-sponsor of this training today. And the center is a network of independent home sharing programs around the country. And our goals are to raise awareness of home sharing and the benefits of home sharing, to encourage best practices and networking among programs, and also to foster the development of new programs. And that's the main reason why we're here today. This is the first ever uh, training for new home sharing programs. And um, we're really excited to have you here in Burlington, Vermont, today. We did the training because last year we developed a resource guide uh, for new program development with the National Center. We did this because we get dozens of calls each month from around the country, people wanting information about starting a program. And because we know that home sharing programs are difficult to start and grow, we know that 50% of home sharing programs that open are not around in five years. Home Share Vermont is offering this training to use our 35 plus years of experience to help other programs succeed. I am pleased to report that for the first time in a decade, we are seeing a real growth in home sharing programs across the country. California alone has experienced a tripling of programs in just a few years. Across the country, 18 states now have home sharing programs. Home sharing is also growing across the globe. 15 years ago, there were six countries with a home sharing program. At the 6th International Home Share Congress in Belgium this year, 18 countries were represented. The United Kingdom has developed an amazing national association that provides training and quality assurance standards for home sharing programs. And we hope to try and learn from their success. The resource guide and this training are a first step in that direction. We're not going to do individual introductions. A lot of you have met each other in the, in the breakfast time, so that's great. Um, at lunchtime, we will uh, do some introductions and talk a little more detail about the program that's, that's to come for the next two days. But I want to um, highlight um, a co-sponsor of ours today. The Center for Media and Democracy will be filming our workshop this morning. And we will make that available to you once it's been edited. Many thanks to Media and Democracy staff and board members who are here today. This evening, we are celebrating their 35th anniversary, a major accomplishment. We're so grateful that they took time out of their busy day to join us for this. Could you raise your hands if you're with Media and Democracy? Thank you. I also want to give you a sense of everyone who's here, so let's see what we can do with some hand raising. If you're from outside of Vermont, raise your hands. <laughs> How about if you're from Canada? Raise your hand. How about if you share a home or have shared a home through Home Share Vermont? Raise your hands. Yay. How about if you're a board member or a volunteer with a home sharing program or a hope to be home sharing program? How about if you work for a home share program? You're getting paid by a home share program. Right. And if you are a home sharing supporter in one way or another, raise your hand. All right, hopefully we're not going to um, Just some logistics, if you could put your phones on vibrate, that would be great. Uh, the bathrooms are in the hallway if you need to use them. Uh, please feel free. Um, today's schedule, we're going to have lunch at 12.35. This workshop will, will go till almost then. Um, our home share hosts are staying for lunch and some of our volunteers and our national program people that are here for the full two days. So um, welcome. Half, half of us will probably be leaving after, after this part of the workshop. They're here as our guests today. Um, 
Those of you who are staying for the two days, you have a three ring binder. We'll talk about that over lunch and what's in there. So our role as a home sharing program is to offer a comprehensive screening and matching service, as well as ongoing support during a match. We're going to go into great detail over the next two days on how to do that. This two-day training is really based on the Home Share Vermont service delivery model and what we have found to work. Use this information as a starting point and modify it according to what works for your organization in developing your home share program. But first, we want to talk about storytelling. One of the greatest challenges for any home sharing program is to get people to share their homes. You wouldn't think so. <laughs> you would think if you build it, they will come. But I'm here to tell you they won't. <laughs> You've got to go out and get them to come. We know from an ARP Vermont survey of Burlington residents aged 45 and above, the majority of people don't want to share their homes. And we know from that survey that as people get older, they're less likely to want to share their homes. Counterintuitive, isn't it? But when you think about it, maybe not. When we think about home sharing, it's something that is a great idea, everybody loves it, but it's always sometimes for someone else, not for us. The biggest barriers from that survey, we found out the biggest barriers to home sharing for people are, are things you would think of, but we had to be told this uh, through a survey. People are concerned about privacy, lack of privacy, by sharing their homes. They're concerned about safety and security. And they're concerned about compatibility, finding the right person to live with. And those are all things that home sharing programs can address. So this is doable, people. This is doable. We have about four times as many people looking for housing as we have homes available. So our greatest challenge is, and continues to be, to find the right home sharers and to encourage more people to share their homes. So this is why we have invited Andy Goodman here to kick off this training. Part of new program development planning must be focused on how you will gain community support and recruit great home share candidates. Not just any home share candidates, but we want great home share candidates. Today we have with us, hopefully, 10 current and former home share hosts who share their homes. We hope to learn from them why they chose to home share and how this can help us tell others to do this as well. So because this is storytelling, I know I have to tell my story here. So I will do this, bare my soul a little here. Um, I share my home uh, through the program. And I decided to share my home maybe, I don't know, a decade ago when I was working for the program and I had an aging mom who lived two towns over and had early Alzheimer's and um, I was running back and forth taking care of her um, and um, I had just been through a separation uh, so I was also taking care of a house and pets and a yard and I was trying to do a full-time job and I was really kind of at my wits end. So I decided to share my home to get someone to live with me so that that person can help me with the house and the pets and I can focus on my mom and on my job. And it worked amazingly well. I had that woman living with me for about two and a half years. Um, my mom passed away uh, during that time, um, but I was able to spend three months um, uh, sleeping at the Converse home in my mom's room every night uh, while she was dying and uh, I was able to get to work uh, during the day and come home for periodic showers once in a while to my own house and uh, really that was a gift uh, in my life uh, that I was able to do that and I don't know how or if I could have done that if I didn't have somebody taking care of of the home and the and the pets so home share is a minor miracle in my life and continues to be uh, a wonderful experience and I'm telling you this because I'm hoping that by the end of uh, our workshop today, you will all become home share ambassadors. <coughs> you will think about sharing possibly your home or telling someone else uh, about home share. So I heard Andy Goodman speak at a national conference last year, and I was blown away. I knew then that I wanted to bring him to Vermont. 
So with no further ado, I'd like you to welcome Andy Goodman. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So um, I want to talk to you about uh, the importance of telling stories. But before I tell you anything about that or, or me, I want to find out something about you. So I've got a question for you. <clears throat> right now, today, when you talk to other people about home sharing, I'm curious, how often are you already telling stories? I'm, I appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> but I'm going to put four choices up here. Take a look at the four choices, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, raise your hands, and we'll do a quick survey of the room. OK. So your first choice is rarely or never. You know, like <laughs> you're a data person. And if that's who you are, that's fine. You can just own that. Second choice is occasionally. You're what I call story curious. <laughs> Maybe you experimented with it in college. I don't know. Third choice is frequently. You really do tell stories on a pretty regular basis. And your fourth choice is all the time, and you're thinking, do I even need to stay for this session? <laughs> right? So given those four choices, uh, and please be honest, I really do want to get a sense of the room. Anybody, rarely or never, just not something I do? Anybody, rarely or never? A cup, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. How about occasionally, every once in a while? OK. Who would say frequently? That's a good number. And anybody all the time? Yes, yes. Good. OK, you all the time, people? You can go. <laughs> Just come back at 12.30 for lunch. Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually I'm gratified to see, oops, to see so many of you in the frequently and the all the time category. Because the other reason I do that survey is by the time we're done today, by the time I leave at 12.30 and you continue on with the rest of the conference, um, I would like everybody in this room to feel like I have to be in the all the time category. That this tool, too powerful, too valuable, for me not to be finding a way to use it every day. So that's what I'm shooting for. So now, a little bit more about my background, because you're probably wondering, well, that's fine. What qualifies you to teach me about storytelling? Which is a fair question. So here's my CV. I was educated at the Walt Disney Jim Henson School of Storytelling. <laughs> and if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I didn't know there was a Walt Disney <laughs> Jim Henson School of Storytelling. There isn't. I just made that up. Uh, however, uh, back in the 90s, there was a television show on the ABC network for three seasons that was a Walt Disney Jim Henson co-production. And I was a writer on that show for three seasons. So if you want to learn a thing or two about telling stories, you could do worse than to work with the Walt Disney and Jim Henson people. They know a thing or two about telling a good story. And if you're wondering, well, what show was that? Uh, well, this was 20 years ago. And this being a room full of intelligent, thoughtful, caring adults, you probably never saw it. <laughs> but just for the record, it was a show called Dinosaurs on ABC. Aww. Anybody remember this show? Yeah. Yes, really? Yeah. Where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> uh, somebody's already shouted out, but the, you've proven my point. Here's a funny thing about this show. Like I said, I was one of uh, eight writers on this show. And we, the writers, thought we were writing this very witty social satire, you know, using dinosaurs to make fun of human foibles. But 20 years later, when I meet people who remember the show, the only thing they seem to remember is that the baby dinosaur that came out of that egg used to refer to its mother as mama and would refer to its father as? <laughs> See, I'm embarrassed for you. For those of you who may not remember, here's a, here's a quick clip. See, like I said, witty social satire. <laughs> so I worked on that. Somebody's getting a call. Yeah. So I worked, sorry, it's so loud. So I worked on that show for three seasons, uh, learned a lot about telling a story. Uh, but then I got out of the TV business, and I had a chance to run a nonprofit that was started by Norman Lear and some of his friends in Hollywood called EMMA, the Environmental Media Association. And the whole idea behind EMMA was to work with, uh, was to be the nexus, the link between the environmental community, 
with all the important messages it had to get out, and the entertainment industry with its huge megaphone for getting out messages. And what our specific strategy at Emma was, we work with writers and producers of TV shows and movies trying to convince them to put environmental messages into their stories. So the idea is you're sitting at home watching your favorite primetime show, minding your own business, and all of a sudden the characters are talking about recycling <laughs> or global warming or what have you. So I ran this organization for five years and that got me into the nonprofit world in Southern California where I started to meet lots of nice people like you. People working at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, people who had devoted their life to making the world a better place. And what I started to find was that these people I was meet meeting, very nice, highly educated, passionate about what they did, but no one had ever told them how to be a professional communicator. So in 1998, 21 years ago this month, I started my own company, the Goodman Center, with the express purpose of helping people at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies communicate more effectively, primarily through storytelling. And over the years, we've done 500 workshops, like the one you're going to go through today, with nonprofits like these, foundations and government agencies like these. We also work with colleges and universities, and we work with some corporate clients as well. There they are. Um, and the other thing is, I've, I've learned a lot from these organizations as I've helped them tell their stories, but I've also been very fortunate to be able to work around the world, uh, working with um, First Nations leaders in British Columbia, uh, people working on uh, sexual violence in Brazil, uh, agriculture in Guatemala, all over the world working with different kinds of people, learning from them about how they told their stories and what came back again and again and again from all these organizations. They said, they said, you know what? They said, when we finally figured out what our stories were and started to tell them consciously, consistently, deliberately, they said it didn't just incrementally improve our communications. They said it transformed our communications. And that's what I'd like to see happen for you guys. So that's what's taken me all the way from Los Angeles to Burlington, Vermont, uh, <laughs> to be here with you today. So that's, a, that's my story in a nutshell. So now let me tell you our story, what we're going to do in the three hours we have together, because it's going to be a very, believe it or not, a very fast three hours. First, I believe storytelling is the most powerful tool you have. I wish I could show you all the research I've seen over the years that, that confirms that. We don't have time to show all of it. So I picked one research study and one case study that I think say the two most important things about storytelling. I'm going to lay that out for you, and hopefully by the end of that, You'll be nodding your head and saying, OK, maybe a little more here than I thought. So that'll bring us to part two, which is, all right, if it's so powerful, how do I do it? How do I tell the kind of story about home sharing that actually gets inside someone's head and stays there and maybe changes the way they think and behave? And then lastly, we'll talk about the kinds of stories you should tell. You've already gotten a sneak preview of that by looking at these tables and how they're named. But we'll talk more about that. And you'll get a chance to work on one of those stories in this room today. And hopefully, if we do things right, you're going to leave today with at least one story in your pocket that you could tell tomorrow. So that's what we're going to do. Is that clear? OK, good. <clears throat> a couple of ground rules along the way. If, you're, if you have a question at any point, any point you think like, I'm not sure about that. I'm confused. I'm skeptical, whatever. Uh, don't wait for Q&A. Uh, we'll stop periodically and take questions, but if there's something that's bothering you, raise your hand and let's deal with it. I hate for someone to be stuck while we're racing along. My teaching philosophy, no adult left behind, okay? <laughs> so let's do this together. Uh, and secondly, if you're wondering, uh, should I take notes? Will I get a copy of the slides? Where are the slides? How do I get the slides? Uh, I'm going to make a copy available to Kirby and she'll make sure that you can all have them. So anything you see up here is coming your way, okay? Um, I think that's everything. Is that clear? Yes. OK, good. Then let's dive in. Why is narrative so powerful? Like I said, two reasons. Here's the first. Stories help us remember. And just to stop and think about this for a second. If somebody tells you something and you forget it, right, you know, in one ear, out the other, then game over. That piece of information has no chance to affect how you think and behave ever again because it's gone. But if somebody can tell you something in a way that it actually sticks in your brain, stays there, 
then that piece of information does have a chance to affect how you think and behave, does have a chance to work on you. And stories have that quality. And I want to show you about, I want to tell you about a study that was done by the University of Minnesota with five-year-olds that illustrates this beautifully. And to tell you about this study, it would be very helpful if a few people in this room right now had in their life a five-year-old son. Ooh, look at this, son, daughter, right here. Very good. Paula, name, that's right. I have Isabella and Gabriella. Okay, which would be your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Depends Sorry. on the time. Depends on the time. <laughs> okay. uh, well, let's just say Isabella, since you said that first. So she's five? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Is she in preschool or kindergarten? Um, kindergarten. Kindergarten, okay. So I want you to imagine this, everybody, but Paul in particular. So one day in Isabella's uh, preschool class, uh, the teacher says, gather around kids. We have a special guest today, a visitor, all the way from the University of Minnesota to come here and she wants to, she wants to play a game with you. And the researcher from the University of Minnesota steps forward and says, hi kids, I want to play a fun game to test your memories. And here's how the game works. I'm going to hold up cards, like you see here, with two sides two panels. And there's going to be pictures of two things, like this. She holds up the first card, and there's a picture of a bar of soap on the left and a shoe on the right. And she says to the kids, in this game, that's our first pair. Soap goes with shoe. I want you to remember that. Isabella, can you remember that? Soap and shoe? <laughs> that's right. So she said she might. OK, I hope so. Uh, otherwise, this game falls apart. That's right. OK, so she says, I want you to remember that soap and shoe. Then she holds up a second card. She says, now, and this card has, let's say, a cloud and a daisy. She says, so you remember soap and shoe. Now I want you to remember this pair, cloud and daisy. Can you remember that too? Sure, OK. Holds up a third card. This one has a baseball bat and a bucket of paint. She says, I want you to remember soap and shoe, cloud and daisy, bat and paint, right? And she holds up for the kids 21 cards. 20, that's right. Paula's already shaking her head. 21 pairs for the five-year-olds to remember. And after she showed them all 21, she says to the kids, OK, that was a lot to absorb. I know that. Let's take a break, everybody. Go out in the playground and play for an hour. An hour. 60 minutes later, she brings them back in the room. She says, all right, kids, gather around again. She says, now comes the really fun part of the game. I'm going to hold up those cards again with the two things. But this time, one of the things is going to be missing, and you have to tell me what's missing. So you get the scenario? One hour later, 21 pairs. How many can the five-year-olds reconstruct? Paula, one hour later, 21 pairs. How many think, what's that? Maybe five? Yeah, five. That would make her a genius. That's it. Maybe he's right. But in this classroom of normal children, <laughs> it was one. That's right. This was them working together as a group? On average, on average, yeah. So it was one. OK, now we're just getting started. We're now going to go, our researcher is now going to go to another school on another day. So I need another five-year-old. There was at this day, you had a five-year-old. Name? Violet. Violet? OK. So we go into Violet's class. This is another school, another day, another group of five-year-olds. Same researcher, almost the exact same procedure, but here's what she says this time. There's a twist. This time she says to the kids, she has the same 21 pairs, but this time she says to the kids, as I hold up each pair, I'm going to call on one of you to put the words in a sentence for the whole class to hear. So she holds up the first pair, soap and shoe. She says, Violet, would you please put the words soap and shoe in a sentence for the whole class to hear whenever you're ready. Um, I went to the store to buy soap and had on my favorite shoes. Very articulate for five. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's right. I'm sure, I'm sure. I went to the store to buy soap and I had on my favorite pair of shoes. OK, good. The kids hear 21 sentences, you know, linking each pair, go out and play for an hour, bring them back, and again, they test them. Compared to the first group that only got one, how do you think Violet's group did? Ten. Oh, almost. Eight out of 21. Oh, wow. All right. One more school, one more day. Someone in the back, five-year-old, son, daughter? Yes. Rudy. Rudy? Yeah. OK, Rudy's a boy? Yeah, she's a girl. She's a girl. That's OK. All right. Uh, so we go into Rudy's class, same 21 pairs. But this time, the instruction, put the words in a sentence that asks a question. 
So five-year-old Rudy, would you please put the word soap and shoe in a sentence that asks a question whenever you're ready. Why do I need soap with my shoes? Why do I need, need soap with my shoes? Very good. The kids hear 21 questions, go out and play for an hour, bring them back and test them, compared to the first two groups, one, eight. How do you think Rudy's group did? Um, I don't know, eight, 10? 16, 16 out of 21 pairs remember. So everyone, look at these results side by side by side, and you tell me, what did the researchers conclude was happening in these kids' brains by virtue of hearing questions it was happening not quite as much when they heard a sentence and almost not at all when they just saw the pairs. What was happening in their brains? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think you know. Yes? Maybe they were making up a scenario about how those things fit together. Exactly, exactly. Now, they don't, they don't jump to that. What's the first thing that happens when you hear a question? Have an answer. You answer it, right? You respond to that. Why do I need soap, was it, why do I need soap with my shoe? Mm -hmm. Right? So, so Rudy would sit there, why do I need soap with my shoe? And the other kids would go, well, if you're going to wash the shoe, you need soap and a rag and water. And to answer the, to answer the question, they start to construct the rudiments of a story. Exactly. This is, by the way, why so much advertising asks questions. Have you ever noticed that? You're driving down the highway, you pass a billboard, and it says, wouldn't you like to be in Paris right now? And you're like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> you know? It pulls you in. It creates a higher level of engagement. So triggered by questions, the kids were a little more engaged. They had to sort of complete the thought. Their minds constructed stories to answer the question. And when they came back in the room and the researcher held up the picture of just the soap, little Rudy sat, th sat there and thought to herself, soap. So, oh, I needed the soap to wash my shoe. Shoe. And she had the other half of the pair. And they did it 16 out of 21 times. So the takeaway from this study, and this is relevant to everybody in this room, and really every group that I work with, if you have some facts about home sharing that you want people to remember, it is much more likely they'll remember those facts if they're contained within a story than if you just give them the facts. Stories help us remember. That's number one. Second. Stories can change people's minds. Now take a moment and think about this for a second. Everybody in this room, all of us, we all walk around with literally thousands of stories in our heads about the way the world works. And as we confront every situation or every new person, we pull out the relevant story to say, does this match up? Does this person, does this situation meet these expectations of the story I have in my head about the way the world works? And if it does, on we go. And if it doesn't, all of a sudden alarm bells go off. Warning, this is different. I need to pay attention. Maybe this is wrong. So if you want to change how people think and behave, sometimes you have to change the software. You have to change the stories that they go to. And I want to give you the, a classic example in a wonderful campaign that was done around the issue of organ donation. Now I know that that's not your issue, but play along for a second. How many people here, show of hands, uh, I've signed up to be an organ donor, if God forbid anything should happen. Look, wow, look at you. That looked like 90% of the room. Who wants to tell me what the national average is in the U.S.? What would you guess? 12%. 12%? That that's extremely depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually it's about 56. <laughs> 56% will. 56% will. 44% won't. Uh, in fact, in most countries that do organ donation programs, it usually, split, it usually splits right down the middle. Um, who can tell me, <clears throat> and don't hesitate to guess because you're going to be right, the people who say no, the people who say, sorry, I'm not signing up, can't do it. Um, some have medical excuses and cannot, and that's fine. But other people have a story in their head about the way the world works that gets them to say, no, this isn't for me. And it's a very strong story, and, and they're, very, they're very firm in that. Uh, who wants to guess what some of those stories are. They won't work as hard to save you if you're an organ donor. Number one answer. Number one answer. The, the, doctor, the doctors or the emergency, like if the emergency services will not work as hard to save me, right? It's like, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm in, I get in a taxi to go back to the airport, and God forbid I'm in a car accident, and the ambulance comes to get me, and he goes, quick, we've got to rush this guy to the hospital, quick. Oh, wait, he's an organ donor? That's right. Take the long way, right? 
People, people, people believe this. They really do. It is not true. It's not true at all that people believe it. That's one. Give me another. Come on, you know this. Yes. Religious or worldview? Number two, religious, religious beliefs. Yeah. You know, when I go to meet my maker, I have to be all there, right? <laughs> right? Uh, the world's largest religions all endorse organ donation, explicitly endorse organ donation. But a lot of people will tell you, no, it's contrary to my religion. Here are the top four. Take a look. Uh, I'm too old. You can be as old as 80 in many cases. Um, and my favorite, uh, that the black market will take over, you know, and instead of my, my organs going to the most deserving next person, like a Kardashian will jump the line, you know, that type of thing. None of these are true. Not one of these are true. But these are stories in people's heads that keep them from signing up. So if we want to change their minds, how do we do it? Well, if you look at the data, you would think, that's, this is impressive. So take a look at some data. Today in the US, right now, about 120,000 people are on a waiting list for an organ. The need so far exceeds the supply. Look at this. 22 people die every day waiting for an organ that's never coming. That's 22 tragedies a day. But here's the thing. If you go to these people, who have those stories in their heads, and you hit them with these numbers, do you know what they say? They say, that's a shame, that's, that's too bad, but doctors won't work as hard to save me, religious belief, Kardashian, whatever, they're sticking to their story. It does, the data does not change their minds. So how do you change their minds if the data doesn't do it? Make it personal. <laughs> I know, that was an easy one. This is a storytelling workshop, right? <laughs> You've got to give them a more powerful story. You need to replace that software that's saying no with another story that's going to let them say yes. You've got to give them a more powerful story. And this was done, <clears throat> and done brilliantly, in a campaign in Brazil, specifically in the town in the red box pronounced in Portuguese, Recife. Recife. Now, whether you've ever been to Recife, you've ever been to Brazil, you've ever been to South America, or you've never been, I'll bet you still know that everybody in Hasifi, everybody in Brazil, really everybody in South America, they're all crazy for the same thing. Just nuts for the same thing. What is it? Soccer, or what they call football, what the world calls football. And in Hasifi, the local team is called Sport Club do Hasifi, and this line with the three stars is the logo of the team, and that's everywhere. That's everywhere you look. You know, it's like if you go to New York City and see the NY of the Yankees, Go to LA, see the LA of the Dodgers. That logo is everywhere in town. People love this team. People would die for this team. Well, hold on. There's a thought. <laughs> if they would die for the team, would they donate their organs for the team? Well, believe it or not, this was the genesis of a campaign where they went to the fans of the team and they said, <clears throat> if you are truly a fan of this team, if you truly love this team, we'd like you to sign up for an organ donor card. Will it look like this? emblazoned with the logo of the team to donate your organs on behalf of the team. But here's the larger story. Here's the new narrative they gave them. They said, if you're a fan of this team and you die, but you pass on your organs to someone else, your fandom lives on forever, <laughs> right? You will become an immortal fan. <laughs> that, that was the name of the campaign, I kid you not. And they added another twist. They said, if you donate your organs and they go into the body of someone who roots for a rival team, you turn them into a fan of our team, <laughs> right? Red Sox fan becomes Yankee fan, that's right. Holy smoke. Um, so, so look, you laugh, you go, that, that, that's cute, that's amusing, that's funny. This campaign was wildly successful. And I wanna show you a short video that shows that. Take a look.
prometo que os seus olhos vão continuar assistindo o esporte. Que os seus pulmões continuarão aspirando pelo esporte. Prometo que o seu coração sempre baterá pelo esporte. Hoje a maior dificuldade que existe no processo de doação é o sim da família. Eu sou rombro negro até depois de morrer, irmão. Tem a alma é rombro negra. Ainda mais se quando eu doar meus órgãos, ou meu pulmão for pro o cara do Náutico, torcedor do Náutico, ele vai respirar o esporte. A campanha atingiu números impressionantes. 51 mil torcedores se declararam doadores. Uma quantidade superior à capacidade da Ilha do Retiro. A campanha do esporte, eu não tenho dúvida alguma, que se viu para que, aumentando a oferta de doadores, a gente conseguisse zerar essa lista, conseguisse realizar o transplante em todos que estavam precisando. A campanha de doação de órgãos lançada pelo esporte está ajudando a salvar a vida de muitos torcedores. Antes do vídeo eu tinha passado 18 anos diabético e 5 anos fazendo uma viagem. E a vida só está melhorando, minha visão está voltando aos pouquinhos. Tô... Eu renasci de novo. Doutor Rodrigo, ele falou para mim e disse, olha, a gente tem um provável coração para sua mãe. Você pode trazer ela, isso com certeza. Que aliviar de saber que eu ainda iria poder ter. Agora estamos com o Diego Novo aqui e ele é do esporte. E vamos continuar fazendo o esporte e vamos aí, torcida do esporte, vamos doar. Vamos tomar essa corrente, né? Vamos, vamos mais parar. By the way, is anybody here from the Pittsburgh area? Anybody here from that area? Nobody? In Pittsburgh, they did a, an organ donation campaign last year where they got uh, sports stars from the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Penguins, and the Pirates to come forward and to say, donate your organs, be a great fan, blah, blah, blah. And they got something like, I think it was about 1,200 people signed up, and they were so proud of that. It's like, ooh, 1,200. 51,000 <laughs> and counting. The, the waiting list for heart and corneal transplants drops to zero. Did you see that? Oh, This campaign was wildly successful. And even better, sport clubs from Paris and Barcelona called them up and said, how do we do that here? <laughs> so this very clever idea may be uh, radiating around the globe. But don't lose a larger point here, because we're not talking about organ donation. We're not talking about soccer. We're talking about home sharing. And here's the point I want to make. Um, Daniel Kahneman, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman, this book, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, he's actually a psychologist, but he won the no Nobel Prize in economics about how people's minds work. And in the book, my biggest single takeaway from this book is this. No one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. You've got to change the story in their head. The way I like to say it is, if you're in the business of changing the world for the better, I do believe that's everybody in this room. If you're in the business of changing the world for the better, you are often first in the business of changing the stories in people's heads about the way the world works. That's just the way it is. And let me bring it home for you. Think about the people you're trying to reach with home sharing, with the idea of home sharing, in whatever place you live. And here's my point. If these are the stories in their heads right now, about the way the world works, no amount of data is going to change their mind. You've got to give them a more powerful, more resonant story that replaces this and allows them to nod their head and go, yes, this is for me. So stories help us remember, so it sticks. Stories change the way we think and behave, making them, I submit to you, the most powerful form of communication you have available to you, bar none. And let me stop there and say, Are you with me so far? Yes. Questions, comments, pushback, any skepticism? Anybody want to say, I'm not convinced? You all good? All right. You're an easy group. All right. 
So then you're ready for part two, which is, okay, if it's so powerful, how do I do it? How do I tell the kind of story that is memorable and persuasive? And here's the good news. This part, you already know. This part is in your DNA. Human beings are natural storytellers. You just have to relax and get out of your own way. So we're going to do an exercise right now so you can relax and get out of your own way. And here's how it works. Right now, I want you to spend two minutes thinking about a time in your life when there was something you really wanted but was difficult to get or achieve. Now, I want you to think broadly. When I say something you really wanted, this may be something you really wanted, like a toy for Christmas. This may be some place you really wanted to go. This may be some job you really wanted to have. This may be some person you really wanted to be with or be rid of. Either way, I don't care. <laughs> Something you really wanted, but was not easy to do, get, achieve, whatever. Find that thing in your mind's eye, okay? Find it. And once you have it, take a good look around at that time and place, because the next thing you're going to do after that, and I'll have more instructions, is to tell a story about that thing, person, place at your table, okay? So right now, spend two minutes finding the thing. You've got pads in front of you and pens. If you want to make some notes, about that time and place, please do. Please do not begin, do not share, do not start. I'm gonna walk around the room and make sure we have things the way we need them. But two minutes, find that thing. All right. Okay, everybody situated? All right, does everybody have that thing? Don't overthink it, it's simple. Doesn't have to be world peace, right? <laughs> All right, so here's how this works. Stay with me, because I've got some instructions for you. At your table, each of you is going to have two minutes, two minutes to tell a story about that thing to the people at your table, okay? You'll have two minutes. To keep you organized, here's how it works. I want you to think of this, your, each table as a clock, okay? This is a clock. This is six o'clock. That's 12 o'clock. Susan, you're 12 o'clock. PJ, 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. The person sitting at noon, you will go first, all right? So when I say go, you will tell your story. We will then move around the table in a clockwise fashion, okay? So if Susan's first, then we'll go to you, 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 etc. The person this makes last, the person who was last at each table, you are the timekeeper. So pull out your smartphone or your watch or whatever. You're gonna keep an eye, make sure that everybody does it in two minutes or less. Now, let me tell you something. We've done this, I've done this exercise, I'm not kidding, over 500 times, so I can tell you something. Two minutes? is a lot of time, okay? So it's not a race. The objective is not to tell your story as fast as possible. When it's your turn, just take a deep breath and tell your story like you would over coffee or a drink or at the water cooler. It's not, it's not that hard. That said, timekeepers, if the person is still talking at two minutes, flash at two. What this means to you, if you get this flashed at you, does not mean stop dead in the middle of your heartfelt story. Okay? What it means is your time has expired, wrap up as quickly as you can. So if you see a two, if you see a two, wrap up as quickly as you can. If the person finishes in less than two minutes, thank you, move on to the next person, reset the clock, and work your way around the table. Question? Should we not include the resolution? Question was, should we not include the resolution? And my answer is, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> my instructions to you are tell a story. I am going to take it on faith that you'll all do, do beautifully, okay? <laughs> Whatever it means to you, you do that, okay? All right. Um, all right, so we work our way around the table. Everybody got that? Person at noon goes first, person last, timekeeper. Timekeepers, when it's your turn, pass the, the clock to someone else so you're not distracted, you tell your story. When everyone at your table has told a story, when we're all done, the person who went first, then and only then, grab this mysterious envelope, <laughs> that's been sitting in the middle of your table, and you will open it up. There's a card inside with instructions on how to complete this exercise. You're gonna lead a little debrief at your table, so there's a card inside that tells you what you do next. Do not wait for me, do not look for me. When your table's all done, just open the card and get to it and complete the exercise. And one more thing, even when you've done that, when you've completed the exercise, when you've had that little debrief at your table, Please do not get up and leave the room because people generally go, oh, well, we're done. I'm going to go to the bathroom now. 
there's something right after that that you need to be here for. So please do not leave the room unless it's absolutely an emergency, okay? I think that's everything. Oh, one more thing. Le oh, sorry, two more things. Lean in, because it's going to get loud. And lastly, when it's not your turn to talk, when you're just listening, just listen. No crosstalk, okay? I don't want to have someone say, oh, yes, I wanted to go to Paris, too. No, because then we're just we're having a whole conversation. So just listen closely to the stories at your table. Those are all the instructions. Is that clear? Yes? OK, first storytellers, are you ready? Timekeepers, are you ready? This should take us no more than 16 minutes. Please begin. <laughs> Okay, we've had 10 dogs in our life, and the last time our dog died, we decided to do it. And Shop called Daiso Pichisan. Gara shop equivalent in Japan. And they only have one shop in Canada, that is in Tokyo. I traveled there uh, three weeks ago, and what I wanted was a hairbrush that I always use to wash my hair when I take shower. And I got it, and I went to Bath to attend the conference. And the first night, the room assigned to me was so noisy, so I asked the, the front to change my room, and then they moved me to another room, but I forgot my hairbrush in the shower stall. <laughs> And like the teacher at one point was like, why don't you guys go to the junkyard and buy things and make things out of it? And I was like, oh my god, I never thought about this. And then I found out there was a junkyard in my city. And I said, oh, you want to get in there. I took my parents on a and all right, everyone should have a little slip that says, I like your story. You all got one? Yeah. Please take it in your hands like right now. Hold it up. Look at it. If you want to make this a moment of self-affirmation, that's fine. But here's what I want you to do. At your table, you just heard five, six, seven stories other than your own. Whatever story you just heard that you like the best, for whatever reasons matter to you, please take this slip of paper and hand it to that storyteller right now. You may not tear it, you may not keep it. Give it to one person, please vote. <laughs> Everyone voted. All the votes are in? All right. As a result of the voting, does anybody have in their hands now or in front of them six or more slips of paper? Did anybody get six votes at their table? Anybody with six? Nobody? Nobody? Five. Anybody have five votes at their table? I see one hand right here. Five. Is that it? One hand? Sir? Would you come forward, please? Give me a hand. Congratulations. He just realized, he just uh, realized the, uh, the dark secret of this game, to win is to lose. Uh, Aaron, have a seat right there, okay? Okay, first two hands I see, first two hands I see, four slips of paper. Anybody got four? One and two. Would you two please come forward? Give me a hand, please. Okay, have a seat over here. Now, are you three comfortable sharing your stories with the whole room? But that's what's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and on film? Was that and on film? And on film. So if you're not, if you, no, 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 no,
If, uh, if not, it's okay. So, uh, are you ready? Yes? I mean, it's technically, technically not my personal story. Um, it's about one of our matches, so I don't know. Is it? I'm a, that's a, I, I've written a match story about it, so it's in the book. You want to change? Oh, so it's, it's been out there? I, I think you're comfortable. Okay. All right, so I need to just talk to them for a second to put them in the right order, so I need you just to just talk among yourselves for a second. Here it is. Here's your topic. Rhode Island. It's neither a road nor an island. Discuss. <laughs> what is your story? Like? <laughs> yes, please. All right. So I'm, gonna ask, I'm asking each of these storytellers to, to come forward and share their story. So we'll start with you, sir. Come on up. Right here. And uh, introduce yourself. And just like you did at your table, just tell your story. My name is Aaron Rutherford. Uh, I work for Home Share Vermont. I do outreach and intake for us, and I get to do match stories for our newsletters. So, one of uh, probably my favorite match story is about uh, this a single mom. Uh, she came to us because uh, she's a principal at a high school, and she'd get home at six o'clock, and she has a special special needs son who gets home at three o'clock. So she needed basically some uh, child care for three hours each day. And when I saw the application, I was kind of worried that we wouldn't be able to find a match because it's not exactly like what we do. Um, so basically, uh, we had met a guest throughout the process. She was moving back up from um, the South. Uh, her husband had just passed away. She wanted to be back closer to her children. She had... Um, she used to run a care home for children, people with disabilities, and seniors in a similar area to where this host was applying from. And the way our program works is that we, our, our staff, or volunteers, bring the applicant, the guest, to the home because we don't give out addresses or anything like that. And as our, our volunteer was um, driving up to the house, the guest started crying. And no one knew, or, or volunteer had no idea what was going on and it turns out that that same home was where the guest had lived 10 years earlier oh. when that's where she had her care home and her husband had helped build the house and she just felt like her husband was willing her back to that home and it was just amazing to the best people and they're the best friends now so. Yeah, I'm Kate Baldwin, and I'm on the board of Ham Home Share Vermont, and I want to thank my table for the votes. <laughs> um, um, so my story is about being a newlywed and um, loving antiques and going all around Vermont and the countryside looking for great antiques. And um, I found one that was this beautiful armoire, and uh, it was at a time when my husband Scott and I were newly married and had no money and this was really such a far reach for me to even think about that I should look at it, look at the price and even hold it in my dreams for wanting it. And um, so the other part of this story is that my husband is a, a pilot in the Vermont Air National Guard and he would go away a lot for deployments. And um, when we were newly married it was always hard to say goodbye to each other and think about the times that he would be away for months at a time, weeks at a time. And um, Scott uh, left this uh, one deployment for, for a deployment. And um, um, after he left, again, it was harder this particular time for him, for us to say goodbye to each other. Um, after he left, um, I um, started finding money all throughout the house. So I would be moving something in a cupboard and there would be money there. And then I would be opening the vegetable drawer in the refrigerator and there'd be money there. And I mean, it was just random, open a book that I was reading. And by the time before he came back, I had enough money to buy this armoire that he knew I loved so much. And um, so I was able to get it. And before we got home, it was in our bedroom. And, and I was telling my table that, it, you know, I look at that piece of furniture and think about how much he cares about me, how tough it was for the times he was away. And, and he did something very magical and special. And um, 
it just was a, a great piece of furniture that we still look at and, and know what it meant for our relationship. So that was my story. Oh, thank you. He wasn't hiding that money for any other reason. But. I don't know. Anyone on the table is going to go home and tell their husband that's <laughs> All right, one more, Renee. Come on. Before I tell my story, I just wanted to say that I was there when we drove up to the house, and the woman says, Oh my Lord, this is, yeah, the, house. Okay. This is the house I used to live in. <laughs> that was quite a moment. There for that match. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, real close. Real close. Sorry, yeah. not a good story. I have to kiss <laughs> um, What I just said is, I was there when that match was made. We drove up to the house, and the woman said, "Oh my lord, this is where my husband and I used to live." And we went inside, and she couldn't believe it that that was possibly where she was going to do a home share for. Very nice. Anyway, my story is a love story, and. Um, I was in college and my roommate and I, during the summers, we used to travel around and um, find places, houses where we could live for the summer with our friends. And so the second summer we were in East Ham on the Cape and one of our days off we worked at restaurants. We hitchhiked up to Provincetown and we're at a beach in Provincetown and there's a very tall, handsome young man sitting down at the beach and there was a little boy there and so I went to talk with this little boy and immediately fell in just in love with this man. And he proceeds to tell me that he lives on Westerly Terrace in Huntsville, Alabama. So my roommate and I, later in the summer, we went to Martha's Vineyard and we biked out to Gay Head and I remember buying a postcard for him. And I sent it to Westerly Terrace, Huntsville, Alabama. Wow. Then we go back to school at University of Connecticut and I'm in my dorm and that was the days where you had a, they phoned up to your, hallway and told you you had a visitor and so I said there's a visitor for Rini and I went downstairs and there he was and I was like I thought you lived in Huntsville Alabama and he said well I really live in Hartford Connecticut <laughs> he, had, he had borrowed his uh, father's uh, I think it's a Bonneville it was a very nice car <laughs> and so from that day on I was 19 and he was 22 and we commenced for many years. He would show up at my doorstep. He would find where I was. And we traveled across the country once. He went to live on Martha's Vineyard and taught school. And then I was still in love with him and I never really met anybody else. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna leave the country. <laughs> so I left the country and I traveled overseas for a year. And I came back and my mother said, oh, David called. And I, I guess he, I don't know, if he really tried to find me that year, or maybe he knew I left the country, I might have told him I can't remember. <laughs> so I was like still in love with this man, and I said, okay, I'll try to find him on Martha's Vineyard. So I went to Martha's Vineyard, and that started, started the relationship again. And we have got married in 1981. We've been married for 38 years with uh, four wonderful girls. And he just recently got diagnosed with lung cancer. And I've been caring for him for the past nine weeks. It's been very, very hard, but we're doing well and we're very positive. <laughs> but the story about Huntsville, Alabama, I still remember how I sent that postcard and never got to him. <laughs> but he showed up anyway. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your story to do that. I want to give each of you a copy of my book, Storytelling is Best Practice, a $20 value. <laughs> there you go. One more round of applause for our storytellers, please. Thank you. Thank you. This is Jessica. All right. Oh, my goodness. So the question that I asked you to consider at your tables and that I asked you to consider now is, what do these stories have in common? You heard five, six, or seven stories at your table. You just heard three more here. So in the span of you know, less than half an hour, you heard as many as 10 stories. And the premise of this exercise was that you don't need me to tell you how to tell a story. That if I just ask you to tell a story, you're going to do it. And everyone did it. And some of you did it quite well. But you all tend to do certain things the same way instinctively because we all know how to tell a story. 
So I asked one person at each table who went first to write down for each table at least three things that your table all did the same way. So let me start at this table over here. And is it April? Yeah. April, one thing from your list that you noticed, just one thing that you noticed that everybody at your table kind of did the same way. There was a sense of serendipity. A sense of, be, be, be more, what do you mean by a sense of serendipity? What do you, what do you mean by that? Okay, I want to underline the word unexpected. Because in storytelling, if a person tells a story where you know what's going to happen every step of the way, that's boring. That's not, that's not interesting. What makes stories interesting is the unexpected, the stuff that comes up. And particularly in a story where it's about you wanting something, if you encounter a moment where something stands in the way of you getting it, an obstacle, a barrier, an antagonist, that's where stories get interesting. You know, if you tell a story where, when I was five, I wanted a bike. I saw this beautiful red bike in the store. I asked my parents, boy, would I love this for Christmas. And next Christmas, they got it for me. It's mine now. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> nobody at that table is handing a slip of paper to that person, because that's just not interesting. But if they said, when I was five, I wanted a bike, and I said to my parents, boy, I really want that red bike. And they said, yeah, go pay for it yourself. <laughs> that's the moment where people lean in and go, oh, well, then what'd you do? So the unexpected, the surprise, the moment where I want runs into you can't, that's where stories get interesting. So thank you for that. Uh, Susan, something on your list that everyone did the same way other than the unexpected? Well, I kind of like the last thing we did. It was number four. It was everybody had a lot of resolve to make something happen. They worked hard. I'll repeat that. She said everyone had a lot of resolve to make something happen. They worked hard. Um, so two things about that. Number one is, if they had to work hard, that suggests that there were a lot of barriers in the way that wasn't just handed to them. And once again, the things that make stories interesting are the things that stand between the hero and the goal. That's what makes it inter interesting. Um, and how they deal with those problems tells you something about the person, reveals something about their character. You know, when they, when they encounter a barrier, do they just fold up and go home? Do they just give up or do they push on? And, and that rep so that speaks to them or the organization they represent. So that's another important aspect. So thank you for that. Linda, you were taking, no, no, sorry, Jean, you were taking notes here. Uh, something on your list we haven't heard. It was a sense, uh, a level of intimacy, relatability. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, I'd say I'm going to underline the word relatability. That when we tell stories, even if we don't personally want, ever want that thing in our life, we can relate to the desire, the journey, the aspects of the pursuit. Uh, relatability is important. You know, that, that connects with the word empathy, that we, that we emotionally connect with a person and we feel involved in the story. And stories are unique in that, in that way. Um, you know, you have in your brain, whether you know it or not, these things called mirror neurons. Mirror, has anybody ever heard that term, mirror neurons? Some one person has. You know how when, you're, when someone yawns near you and you start yawning, yeah. right? Someone starts to cry, you feel like crying. Your body is wired that way. That's mirror neurons. They are reflecting the emotion that you're seeing, the action you're seeing. So when you tell a story that's relatable, where you can go, oh, I know exactly how you feel. I feel the same way. You're actually feeling the feelings. And when you feel feelings in your body, it leaves a marker in your brain saying, remember this. This is important. So relatability, empathy, another absolutely critical aspect of stories. So there's an element of trust and belief that each of us would get what we were striving for. I like, I like when you say trust. Well, more like trust in yourself, that you could make it happen. I see. So that, that again, that sort of relates, I think, to what you said earlier about the, the perseverance, the, yeah. the pushing through. Um, PJ? Um, to not repeat anything. Yeah. But, um, all of our stories had some life-changing element to it. So there was a, there was a fairly dramatic change as well. Very good. And sometimes change is small and sometimes change is big, but there's always change. Stories are not about the status quo. If you start here and end here, nothing's happened. There has to be some level of change. That's another good word. Karen, are you taking notes at your table? Yep. Some, do you have some of your list we haven't heard yet? Um, for our table, we'd always say what we were going to talk about. So we gave the intro out and then we'd also give background in the story. Yes. So intro, background, context at the beginning. 
Everyone will do that. You know, I didn't say to you, when you start your story, please give us your age, the date, or geographic location, right? <laughs> but you all do it. You all, you all start up with, you know, give me some type of context. I was a newlywed. I was in college. You know, one day we were with this single mom. You'll sit, set the scene. You'll set the starting line. This is a story about me wanting something. Okay, I know that going in. That's the premise. But what I don't know is, where are you? When are you? Fix the story in time and space. Good. Back table there. Who's taking notes? Oh, I guess uh, they were personal stories. Personal. <laughs> and and, and that, that sort of comes with the territory, I think. How about uh, the table in that corner there? Um, all of our stories involved buying from other people from our natural support systems. So there are other people in the story. Yeah. Stories are always about people. That's another thing. That, and you won't have, talking about home sharing, you're not going to have a problem with that. But people tend to want to tell stories that are about systems or policies or data and stuff like that. Forget it. You know, people listen to stories because stories are about people. They want to know, what did this human being do? What can I learn from that? So stories are always about people. Uh, Greer, were you taking notes at your table? Yeah. Um, Anything we haven't covered? All of our stories are just about learning and education, just like about... Learning. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's another thing about storytelling is that in the course of the journey, the person who wants something learns something, that there's some learning, there's some lesson, there's some meaning. I think this table here is the only one I haven't called on. Uh, Celia, were you taking notes at your table? Oh, no, we did. Oh, did we, I called on you guys? Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody, any table I missed? I think you've got it all. So, so let's do this. Let's look at the parts of story. You've, you've identified all the parts of story. It's all there. But these parts have specific names. So let's use the right terminology so that we're all using the same language from now on when we talk about the parts of story. So here's where we begin. All stories start by introducing us to a character that we can follow through the story, and we call this person the protagonist. At your table, when it was your turn to speak, it was you. You're the protagonist. This is my story, my journey, follow me. But the important thing here is no matter what you're talking about, an organization, a policy, a procedure, a program, people relate to people. So if they're going to listen to your story, the first question in your audience's mind is, who is this story about? Is it about you? Is it about someone sharing their home? Is it about someone looking to find a place to live? Who is the person I'm going to follow through this story? And tell me something about her. Where is she? When is she? Fix the story in time and space. Establish what we call her world in balance. You know, I'm Kate. I'm a newlywed. I love antiques. I travel around looking for them. This is who I am. That's her world in balance. She's a newlywed. She loves antiques. You got the picture. Then something has to happen to throw that world out of balance. And we call that thing the inciting incident. Like a bolt from the blue it comes. There it is. <laughs> Throws her world out of balance and gives our protagonist a goal. Not something she can just reach out and grab, something she's got to work for. Kate wants this armoire. But it's super expensive. It's not within the ballpark. So it's not like she can just buy it. It's going to be a journey for her to get there. Somebody wants something. A story's in motion. Now, this is going to sound like a vast oversimplification, but, but bear with me. Think about a TV show you've been watching lately, something you've been binging, a movie you've seen, book you're reading. The plot, the story, does it not basically boil down to Who's it about, and what do they want? Yes? It's pretty much it. Even if there are multiple characters, who, who, who's it about, what do they want? And once you know that as an audience, you're dialed in. You're locked in. OK, I know who it's about. I know what they want. Let's go. Let's see if they get it. You got me. Now, what happens next is critical. You guys mentioned it a few times. But this is something we tend to leave out in storytelling. On the way to the goal, there has to be some type of barrier or obstacle that keeps the person from just achieving the goal right away. Because without it, there's no story. That's what makes stories interesting. This is the uh-oh moment, the moment where the audience goes, oh, didn't see that coming. So then what'd you do? How did you surmount that barrier? How did you get around it? And I'll tell you something. This isn't just me talking. This is 100,000 years of evolution talking. We have literally evolved as a species to need this in our stories if we're going to be interested. And I'll prove it to you. 
Want to, want to do a short course in human history, okay? <laughs> Let's jump back in time 100,000 years, okay? It's 100,000 years ago today. It's a Thursday. <laughs> you see these two cavemen? You see the bush in the distance between them? Well, 100,000 years ago on this very day, the two cavemen turned around and noticed that the bush was shaking. Now, there's no wind blowing. There's no reason for it to be shaking, but it's shaking. The caveman on the left observes this unusual phenomenon, and he thinks this. The caveman on the right sees the very same thing, but he thinks this. <laughs> and unmoved by the unusual event, the caveman on the right goes his merry way, whistling a merry tune, and a saber-toothed tiger leaps out of the shaking bush and eats him alive. The caveman on the left, he survives. His DNA gets passed down. We are his descendants. The caveman on the right, not so much. So the point is, and this is a serious one, human beings, homo sapiens, evolved as a species to pay very close attention when something happens that we don't expect. And 100,000 years later, when we don't have saber-toothed tigers jumping out of bushes, we're still that same species that needs something unexpected to, to galvanize our attention. So when someone tells you a story, there has to be a moment, a sort of shaking bush moment, where you go, oh, didn't see that coming. That's interesting. You have my full attention. Without it, there's no story. In storytelling, until I want runs into you can't, you don't have a story. And if we can surmount that barrier, only to run into another, and maybe even another after that, in storytelling, the more the merrier. With every new barrier, a little more drama, a little more tension. Is she ever going to get there? Is he ever going to do it? We call this middle portion the rising action of the story. Tension ratcheting up as we wait to see what happens. And then finally, we surmount the last barrier, and maybe we get to the goal. Success. We got what we wanted. It's a success story. Or maybe we don't. Maybe we don't get to the goal, something else happens, but there's a clear resolution and clear meaning. What you're looking at here, what you did instinctively with no instructions from me other than tell a story, you told the classic three-act story. Act one, what people just call the beginning, answers the questions in the audience's mind, who is this story about and what do they want? Act two, the middle. The pursuit of the thing. Act three, the end, what happened, and what it means. And this is not my structure. This does not belong to any race, creed, religion, nationality. You can travel anywhere in the globe and talk to people about storytelling, and they will connect with this model. It's not the only way to tell stories. There are other ways of doing it as you get more sophisticated, but it is the most commonly used way. And if you want to tell stories about home sharing, all these elements must be present if you want your audience to start nodding their head and go, oh, this is a good story. You have my full attention. Any questions about this structure? Is this clear? Yes, go ahead. I get, I get the structure, but I have a couple of questions about, I guess, process. Go ahead. Um, my first question is about when you, the, the method of just like jumping into the middle of the story so you get somebody's attention right away. Right. How effective is that versus starting with, this is a story about and I am? That, that can be very effective. That um, sometimes you give people you know, the, the red meat. You give them something right up front that is going to just galvanize them. And then once you've hooked them, then you can sort of backfill, well, how do we get to this incredible moment? Lots of, lots of, when you go to movies these days, lots of movies, particularly action movies, will start with something very dramatic up front to, to pull, pull you in, and then there'll be a pause and the credits will roll, and then they'll sort of, the story will step back to how did we get to this moment? So that's a legitimate way of doing it. It's a little, it's a little harder, a little trickier as a storyteller to pull that off, but it is an effective technique. Great, thanks. And my second question yeah. is, um, we're thinking about telling stories from the perspective of like different personas, I guess. So you take, okay, here's a, the, um, uh, kind of a, not a personal story, but a, a story made up of a collection of actual stories. Yes. And so here's a single divorced 
woman on fixed income yes. looking for this. Here's a young family looking for this and follow them through the process. Right. They're not necessarily true stories, but they're true in their meaning and yes. fact. Is that also effective? Yes. Uh, uh, let me give you a sort of the, uh, the, the, the uh, continuum. Best case scenario in storytelling, in storytelling is to tell a story that is completely factual and true. This is a story of Linda. She was looking for someone to share a home with and she met Paula. And Linda and Paula have both said, yeah, tell my story, you, you can have it. So all the facts, all the things are exactly as is. That's the best case scenario. Real facts and, and full permission. Second is uh, Linda and Paula say, yeah, you can, you can share the story, but uh, would you just mind changing my name in a few specifics so that uh, protect privacy? And so you do that. So you tell the story of, of Linda, not her real name, and Paula, not her real name. Uh, and you change a few facts, but the story is essentially true. And you've disclosed to the audience or the reader, this is a true story, names and a few details have been changed to protect privacy. Now, the last choice, which is what you've talked about, is sometimes people have said, our community is so small that even if you change the name and a few facts, everyone's going to know who you're talking about. So in that case, then you have the option of creating a composite character. And you say, this is the story of Linda who was looking for a place to live and Paula who had a, a room to share. And at the end of the story, you say, this is actually the story of many different home sharing experiences. Linda represents many different people who've been looking for places to live. Uh, Paula represents many different people who had places to give. Uh, so while these are, not true, these are not factual stories, they are truthful nonetheless. They're all based in truth, inspired by a true story. Uh, but you again, you must disclose that to the audience. You cannot tell a story and not disclose them if you have changed any aspect of it. That's the only thing you can't do. Okay, good. Yes. Yes, this, this whole exercise reminded me of something I heard before. People will not remember what you say. Right. They'll remember how you made them feel. Right. And this whole exercise just kind of reinforced that because when, you, it, when you're telling your story, they're listening and so forth, but if you say, now what do you think about that? That's when they make that connection, and it's the way you make them feel rather than just your story that's involving them in your story. Yes, you know, and I saw that in the room. You know, when Aaron told his story, where's Aaron again? There he is, we told his story about in that moment where the woman said, I felt like my husband was willing me to, to be here. I mean, you could, you could hear in the room physically people going, oh, you know, it's like, it's like we're all feeling it. And, and there's, there's a biological thing happening here. When you, I'm not sure if it's, if it's dopamine or oxytocin or what it is, but when you feel something, there are, the, there are these um, chemicals in your brain that leave like markers. You know, if I put, let me put it this way. If I said to you, think about the last time somebody said something to you that was insulting, when you were insulted. Okay, can everybody find that? It's like, you don't have to search too hard because you felt something. If I said, tell me about the last time someone said something to you, a really good compliment, right? You're going to remember that too because that stuff makes, makes you feel something in your body and leaves a marker in your brain, you know? If I said, tell me about the last time somebody talked to you about some policy, about some housing policy, it's like, I can't remember that. But something about how you feel, yeah, because you, your body does that. So one of the, that's one of the reasons we tell stories. If you can tell a story with real emotion to it, we're not trying to be manipulative. We're not trying to be melodramatic. We're trying to help them remember, help them feel it. So you're absolutely right. Yes, Lindsay. My question has to do with a challenge that I think is unique to the home sharing you know, situation, which is we have two protagonists. Yeah. And one of them is the mother, and one of them is the housemaid and the homeowner and right. tell them in a way that's concise, yes. you know, um, and I find myself often trying to toggle between this, you know, the background and the story of, you know, right. their student housemates, <laughs> yeah. uh, which have, you know, their own barriers and their own victories and, you know, that they go through this uh, process yeah. um, and then trying to, you know, dovetail it together so that it's the resolution, the goal is a successful home chair. Well, what I'd say that, and I, I, t I totally get that. You're, you're, there are two, two key players in the story. Um, so what I would ask you is, when you tell stories, the first question I'm, I'm going to ask you, and you're going to see this on a template I'm going to pass out, is who is your audience? If you say, I'm talking to a room full of uh, people who have homes to share, who have rooms to share. I have a room full of potential, what do you call them? 
host. I have a room full of potential hosts. I'm going to tell you a story that's primarily from a host's point of view. So that they're going to say, oh, that person's just like me. Oh, and she made the decision to do that for these reasons. Well, that resonates with me. I've got it. Because that's, that's who the audience is most likely to identify with. If you're, if you're at a college campus and you're talking to a room full of college kids about why they should take advantage of these rooms that are available in their, in their community, then I would tell a story from the point of view of the guest. <laughs> right, from the student's point of view. So in choosing your protagonist, the person you focus on, ask yourself first, who am I talking to and who are they most likely to relate to? Now, if you have a mixed audience, then, you've got, then basically you'd have to make a judgment call. Right, and I think, you know, as we discussed, like homeowners are really the you have to have a homeowner before you can get the housemates. Yeah. You have to have the honey for the flies, you know. So right. if you're going to choose one of on the story, <laughs> the, the homeowner is the one you choose. But um, so I, I find that sometimes the homeowners are actually quite held by the stories of the students. Do you, do you hear that? So the, the, the homeowners, the hosts, are compelled often by the students or the guests. Yeah, because it, it changes the narrative in terms of like, what is the motivation to solve my problem or to be the solution to somebody else's problem? Interesting. Like that's that. interesting. So it's a, it's very, it gets very complex when you really have two very strong yeah. personal Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, I'm assuming you're going to get to this, but just the, um, I think I've heard that for an ad, you need to hear it seven times for it to sink in. So is storytelling, do you repeat the same story to or is it the same element of a story? You know, how do you think about that retention and action that well, would be from a storytelling versus ad campaign? Yeah. Well, the the, one of the differences we're talking about here is if, you, if you're doing like a 30-second radio ad where they say you must repeat the phone number five times, the reason you have to do that is because trying to get someone to remember something like digits yes. or something with no emotional content, yeah. good luck, right? You'll need to do it three times. The thing about stories, if you can tell a story with a strong emotional hook, with a, with, with a moment where people go, oh, like, your job is done. They're going to remember that story. Uh, now, you can repeat that story several times, because sometimes, sometimes people enjoy hearing the same story again. But then after a while, depending on your own, you may want to cycle in fresh new stories. Because if someone says, oh, god, there's that story again, it's like they only have this one story to tell. You know, then it feels like you only have one story to tell. Uh, let me move on because I want to keep us on schedule. I want to show you an example of this in action, this model in action. Uh, Surfers Healing is a nonprofit organization in Southern California that works with children with autism and their parents. They're going to tell their story in this public service announcement in 60 seconds. Now, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, this has been airing on ESPN for years as part of a campaign they have there. But whether you've seen it or not, I want you to watch it with new eyes. Because watch how in 60 seconds they will touch all the bases of the three-act structure in order. Answering the questions that I said have to be answered by your, by your story. Who's it about? Who's our protagonist? What does he want? What's the goal? What stands in his way to make it interesting? The barrier. How does he navigate that barrier? Where do we end up? And what does it mean? Now those questions are not asked and answered explicitly, but it's there. So take a look. And then we'll, I'll ask you to, to, to show me how it works. <coughs> My name is Izzy Paskowitz, and I've been running surf camps for autistic kids for seven years. We get them down to the beach. The kids are going to scream. Some of the kids, they don't know how to speak. The only words that come out of their mouth is screaming. screaming and the kicking when they go out that when they turn around and ride that way then it's just nothing like it and there's a parent some tears in their eyes saying man we've had a lot of tough times but today was just a perfect day Who's the protagonist of this story, as told? Kids? No, not the kids. Yeah, it's the narrator, Izzy Paskowitz. Uh, the kids are important, and we care about the kids, but we're not seeing it through their eyes. We're seeing it through his eyes. 
And so, what, so if he's our protagonist, what is his goal? What's he trying to do there on the beaches of Southern California? <laughs> yeah, we're not curing autism today. We're taking these families and these kids who are facing a difficult, serious days, and we're just gonna have a fun day. We're gonna share the joy of surfing. That's it, that's what we wanna do. What's the barrier? Autism. Autism, fear, right? We saw the kids literally kicking and screaming on the beach. Kids don't wanna go, okay? So, how do they, how do they overcome that barrier? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. They just, it was, we're going, right? And the meaning of the story, well, hint, this is a public service announcement, airs on ESPN. So what meaning do they give? Sports. Sports. Right, that sports are not just about who won or lost, that a sport, in this case the sport of surfing, can have a higher value. And, but I mean, look, beautiful, beautiful visuals, it's nicely put together, but what I really want you to see is how it sits on that very solid structure, answering the questions that are instinctively in your mind, whether you're conscious or not, who's it about? What does he want? What stands in his way to make it interesting? How does he deal with that? Where do we end up and what does it mean? And if your stories can answer all of those questions, then you have a story that touches all the bases. Any questions about what makes a good story? Uh, we'll go in the back here first and then come forward. Yes, go ahead. Um, Kirby mentioned at the beginning, and ended up in one of your slides too, um, a lot of times when we tell our stories, it's the response you can get is like, wow, that is great. It sounds perfect for someone else. Mm -hmm. So or, like, do you have a, an underappreciated or less obvious kind of tip or trick for how to draw people in and make them feel like, no, you actually could be, this could be part of your story, not just for someone else. You know, I think, I think you have to, uh, it, it, it's, not, not, it's not easy to answer that question, but I think if you have a protagonist who is someone who has a home to share, whose initial attitude is exactly that, I think this is a lovely program. It's just not for someone like me. And in the course of your story, that person converts. Then I think the audience members who are sitting there going, that's me. It's like, lovely idea, not for me. That I mean, stories of that conversion, I think, are what you really have to find. Kimberly. Yeah, I was wondering where stories where you don't reach the goal can really, where that is. The question is, where do stories where you don't reach the goal? What, what's the place of that? There is a specific uh, category. That we call those the nature of our challenge stories. Sometimes you'll tell a story where uh, things have not worked out. You, know? you have a, a story of a student living in, in a town, looking for a place to live, cannot find anything, and ends up couch surfing for months on friends' couches because there's just no place to go. That's not a happy ending. There's no good resolution there. But that story is a kind of story where you say, that's why we need this program. It's a story that defines the nature of our challenge. So there is a category of stories where the resolution is, things are not the way they should be. We need your participation to, to give us a happier outcome. Does that answer your question? Good. Other questions? OK, good. We are exactly where I want to be. I've got five of 11. Let's take a 15-minute break. Come back here at 11.10 for our, uh, our next part. 15 minute break. All right. Thank you. So part three, this is, the, this is the, where the rubber meets the road. What kinds of stories should you tell? So we've divided, uh, we've divided the room up into three categories. Here, each of your tables has a, uh, has a label there. I, I hope you've seen that. First category, a story showing how people can maintain their privacy when home sharing. That can be from the point of view of the host or the guest. Stories about privacy, clearly a big factor. A story showing how home sharing promotes safety and security for our participants, another major concern. So do you have a story that can show, that can show no, you've got nothing to worry about here, you're going to be safe and secure in your home, or the guest will be safe and secure. And third, a story showing how agencies help ensure compatibility for the people participating in home sharing. So privacy, safety and security, compatibility. Each of you has a table that has one of those uh, as the defining uh, issue for that table. So what we want you to do in the next 20 minutes is we want you to take these templates that I've passed out. Everybody should have one at your table. If you haven't, there's a stack in the center. Pass it around.
Does everybody have one? So here's what we want you to do. You can work as an individual, as a small team, or as an entire table on a story. I don't know what's doing, why it's doing that. Oh, is that what happened? Okay, I won't do that again. Sorry. That's right. I'll just, the, rest, the rest of the workshop will be done like this. Um, so again, you, if, you, if you can have a story that, for example, this table here, what's your theme? Safety and security. Safety, if you have a safety and security story, if, if Susan had one on her own, say, well, I'm going to work on that. If you two, Paula and Kimberly, said, well, we've got one we're going to work on together. Or if the whole table said, you know, let's work on this as a team, we want each table has to produce at least one story along that theme. And this template is to help you work through the story. So let me walk through the template in terms of what we want you to write on this. With a pen or pencil, answer these questions. Question number one, audience, to whom would you tell this story? Are you talking to a room full of potential hosts, a room full of potential guests? Are you talking to legislators because you need funding to move this forward? Who is your audience? Even if you have multiple audiences in your travels, for the purpose of this exercise, pick one. You can, you, can, you can sort of define a fairly homogeneous group as your audience, OK? So who would I tell this story to? And then the second question is the point. What one point do you want listeners to take away upon hearing this story? Well, this kind of answers that question. This is a story that's going to show how we ensure safety and security. This is a story that's going to show how your privacy can be maintained. That's a, you know, it's basically going to be one of these three points. So the idea here is once you know who you're talking to, and what point you want to convey to them, then you're ready to get into the guts of your story. Act one, who is the protagonist of the story? Is it you? Is it a colleague? Is it a host? Is it a guest? Who is the person we're going to principally follow through the story? Tell us something about him or her. What is the setting? Where are we? When are we? Fix the story in time and space. We have to know the starting point. What is the protagonist's goal? I am someone with an extra room in my house. I'm looking to find someone to share it who I can be comfortable living with. I am a student. I have very little money. I'm looking for a place to live. Whatever. Who is it about? What do they want? That's what Act 1 should tell us. Back of the page. Act 2. What is the first barrier standing in the protagonist's way? These can be internal or external. I am someone with a home, home to share. I have rooms. I'm scared. I think I'm going to get someone who's going to ruin my life, uh, take away my privacy, make me unsafe. Um, or I'm, I, I'm a student. I've moved to this new area. I don't know anybody. I have no contacts. I don't even know where to start looking. What's the first barrier to stay in the protagonist's way? How does your protagonist pursue the goal? How do they respond to that barrier and subsequent barriers that come up? There needs to be at least one. In Act 3, what is the resolution? Do we have a happy ending here? Host finds guest, guest finds host. Uh, do we have an unhappy ending? Person looking for a place never finds one because there's just not enough available. And the meaning of the story is we need more places. So whatever it is, what's the resolution? What's the meaning? Each of these boxes, each of these spaces can be filled with a sentence or two. I am not asking you to write out your entire story on this piece of paper. Just enough to organize your thoughts so that when we are ready and we can call on volunteers, you can come to the front of the room with your thoughts organized and tell us a good three to four minute story about home sharing. OK? Again, each table has to have at least one story. So you either you work with a full group or you break up, but there better be at least one. So you may want to have to talk to each other about how are we doing this table, and then you can go to work. Those are the instructions, questions. Yes? So I'm guessing that an unhappy ending would not be one that tells how privacy was not secured. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, we don't, want to tell, we don't want to tell failure stories to say, this is something you don't want to do. <laughs> An unhappy ending would be, would be the, the person who has the room to share, who, has, who just you know, is lonely and, and has not found somebody and, and has, you know, can't do all the chores and, and is stuck or it's the person looking for a place to live who can't find it. Those are the unhappy endings we're OK with, because that's what, that's what uh, clarifies the need for this, for this program. An unhappy ending that clarifies the need is fine. 
Good question, though. Okay. Yes. So if there are five different stories, maybe individually, yes. do we choose them? Do we all go around and sort of share the story and then choose them? <laughs> the, question. the question is, if there are, if, let's say their table, there are five different stories. How do we decide which one gets shared in the room? Uh, I will work with your table when it comes to <laughs> the time, OK? I'll help you figure it out. You know, generally, we don't have a, I, I've r rarely run into a surfite, uh, surfite, is that the right word, surfite? An excess of volunteers. <laughs> That's it. Generally not been a problem. Kirby. In, in the, most tables we have a, a current home share host or a former host, so um, they might provide some inspiration for a story yes. uh, uh, that you might want to. Yes, tap talk. that expertise, please. <laughs> any, any other questions? OK, ladies and gentlemen, I have, um, I have 11.20. Let's take 20 minutes. Let's go to 11.40. Please begin. My friend Paul was a good grandson. He's trying to be a good grandson. <laughs> Never heard that. Um, to get us back in storytelling mode, uh, whenever I see good stories, I collect them. I always like to share them. I think you learn by watching people tell good stories. Uh, Andrew Solomon has a TED Talk. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, I urge you to watch the entire thing. It's called How the Worst Moments in Our Lives Make Us Who We Are. Uh, in it, he tells a story uh, in two parts. He tells you the story in the middle of the talk, and then he ends by referring back to that story. So first, I want you to hear the story. Um, and I think just the simplicity of it is part of what I want to get across. A good story doesn't necessarily, you know, we're not talking about the sweep of Lawrence of Arabia here. We're just talking about capturing a moment. So take a look at Andrew Solomon. When I was in second grade, Bobby Finkel had a birthday party and invited everyone in our class but me. My mother assumed there had been some sort of error, and she called Mrs. Finkel, who said that Bobby didn't like me and didn't want me at his party. And that day, my mom took me to the zoo and out for a hot tub Sunday. OK, got that? <laughs> so you know, screw Bobby Finkel. <laughs> uh, so at the end, he comes back to end his talk, and you can now refer to the story. So now that you know it, the ending will have more meaning. In October, it was my 50th birthday, and my family organized a party for me. And in the middle of it, my son said to my husband that he wanted to make a speech. And John said, George, you can't make a speech. You're four. <laughs> <laughs> Only Grandpa and Uncle David and I are going to make speeches. <coughs> but George insisted and insisted. And finally, John took him up to the microphone and George said very loudly, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? And everyone turned around, startled. And George said, I'm glad it's Daddy's birthday. I'm glad we all get cake. And Daddy, if you were little, I'd be your friend. Oh. And I thought, thank you, I thought that I was indebted even to Bobby Finkel, because all those earlier experiences were what had propelled me to this moment, and I was finally unconditionally grateful for a life I'd once have done anything to change. The gay activist Harvey Milk was once asked by a younger gay man what he could do to help the movement, and Harvey Milk said, go out and tell someone. There's always somebody who wants to confiscate our humanity. And there are always stories that restore it. If we live out loud, we can trounce the hatred and expand everyone's lives. Forge meaning, build identity. Forge meaning, build identity. And then invite the world to share your joy. Thank you. I encourage you to watch, watch the whole talk. It's 20 minutes, he's marvelous. 
Um, but that's some good storytelling right there. All right. So what I want to do now is, uh, until we're done, is to invite uh, one person, at least from each table, to come up and share a story. Um, I have uh, five more books left for the first five volunteers uh, as your inducement. But let's hear, let's hear some stories about home sharing based on the, the three themes we've identified. So let's see. We'll start with, uh, uh, let's see, is it this table right here? Do we have someone from this table designated to be our storyteller? Kimberly? Give her a hand, please. Right. I, think, I think it's the moving. Kimberly, here, take this mic. So here's what I want you to do. I'll help you through this since you're the first one. First, tell the audience, who did you write down? Who is the audience for this story? Who is the specific audience you want to talk to? We wrote our story for prospective hosts. OK. So, <laughs> So you are a room full of prospective hosts, OK? You listen with that, 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 those ideas. You have a room full of prospective hosts. So what I want you to do now is I want you to take a deep breath. And I want you just to tell us a story. You can look at your notes. You can refer to your notes. But you are not to read from them. You are not to tell us about a story. You're just going to tell us a story, OK? OK. When she's done, you will applaud thunderously <laughs> to, to, to thank her. And then the, you'll stay here. And there's two, two bits of feedback I want you to give her. One, I want you to tell Kimberly what you liked about the story, what she did well based on what you now know makes a good story, and any thoughts about how you could help, how she could make it better the next time she tells it. Okay? So with that, Kimberly, the floor is yours. All right. This is a true story, but some details have been changed to protect the privacy of the people in the story. So uh, we start with a uh, man. I'm going to turn these off. Turn this one off. Go ahead. All right. So we start with a man who uh, immigrated to the US years ago. And he's been in the US for a while now. And he went to college, got a uh, PhD and is educated and he moved up to Vermont but his family is still out of state. He was assigned to Vermont um, by his job. He works for the federal government and he was living in a hotel and that was not a good situation for him. It wasn't uh, secure financially and you know not having any housemates at all wasn't you know a very safe comfortable situation so he heard about home share through his job and he went to meet our uh, prospective host and they got along quite <coughs> well and he moved in and there's they had a good uh, financial situation and they both uh, lived together well and have a much safer life by being together. Um, yeah. The end? The end. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm going to speak with my outside voice so we don't have these microphone problems. Uh, so two bits of feedback for Kimberly. Tell her what you liked about the story, the, the, thought, the things she did that, that helped you get into the story, and any way you can help her make it better next time around. So let's have some, some good, positive, constructive feedback here. Who's got something they want to share? Yes. Um, I liked that we knew who the character was <coughs> and what their current situation was and a little bit about their background. So I got a sense of their struggles. And what so the did. details, immigrating to the US, uh, job takes them to Vermont, works in the federal government. That helped us to get a picture of him. Now, I think you identified him as a man, mm -hmm. yes? Uh, did we never got a name. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, we named him <coughs> Fred. OK. Now, so he's, is Fred, Fred is based on a real character? Yes. OK. So it's important to use a name, because if you say Fred, people will attach to a name and start to invest human <coughs> qualities. But if you say a man, or a, a guest, or a client, or whatever terminology, then you see like a black silhouette. You know, you don't see, or somebody with a black bar over their eyes. Uh, so in storytelling, even when you're creating fictional characters, uh, use names. So you say, well, man, we'll call him Fred. It gives, it gives us something human to, 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 to latch on to. 
Good. What else? Other feedback? Yes, Diane. Although Kimberly didn't say it directly, uh, her description, I had the sense that Fred was really was lonely in yes. addition to you know, other issues going on, but that his family was far away. And she didn't actually come out and say it. I'm not sure she had to, but I definitely got that feeling like he was looking for something. <coughs> I was trying to paint that picture. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, I think well, maybe a few more details. I mean, the story needs an, an emotional, people have to connect emotionally. So if you want to say that you know, he goes back to his hotel room every night, and look, there's a, there's a bed and a TV and a dresser, and it's kind of dreary, and the window looks out on train tracks, or you know something that, that conveys to us this, this poor guy back in his hotel room. You don't even have to say he's lonely, we'll get it. But more visual details. Because another thing about storytelling, when it's just Kimberly and a mic and a message, there's no visuals. All you're getting is what's coming out of her mouth. So you, it's up to you to provide the visual details that help people see it in their mind's eye. If they can see it here, they can feel it here, and then they're ready to do something. Other feedback, things she did well, things she could do better? Yes, April. So theirs was safety and security, and you said that they felt secure, but there wasn't anything that showed me to begin with that they weren't safe and secure, and then how that was actually achieved. It was just, you simply just said, Right. And then they felt safe and secure. And yeah, it gets a little bit pat. Meets the host, they have a good meeting, he moves in, it's a good, it's just, it was all good at that point. And that's where the story stops being interesting. So we, we, need, we need more details about uh, Fred's concern going in or the host's concern or, or anything that, that, that shows us that there could be some bumps in the road. Yeah, we started from the host's point of view and we're trying to flesh out the guest's point of view, but we like we had limited details and we're like trying to piece it together, but yeah, it, more would have been, you know, good. And then having actual examples for, you know, how he actually felt, like that would have been great if we like. How, you know. from the host perspective, you know, what were my concerns right. about mm -hmm. safety and security? So yep. if I'm looking at that from the host perspective, like here's some of the things I'm concerned about and then how those yeah. are resolved. Mm -hmm. Need those details. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, go ahead, Aaron. Um, I think I would have preferred if you skipped the we've changed his name for privacy. Because uh -huh. I, I just I started thinking about uh, like this guy and who he is. Like, I don't know. It got me thinking about maybe who is he as opposed to just like a good story right. to connect with. So, and, and, and that, yeah, that, that, that's not a bad point. That the technique is if you say, I want to tell you a story about Fred, and then you tell the whole story, and at the end you say, by the way, we've changed some names to protect privacy. Pull people in, get them in the story. Don't, don't, don't just. When you say we've changed names and details up front, it's a little bit distancing. So just tell them the story. You know, I want to tell you a story about Fred, and we're and we're into it. Okay, um, good story. Be better next time around. Kimberly, thank you very much. Here, I trade you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right, we're going to jump to the back of the room. Uh, that right there. Oh, I see a hand going up. Come on up. Give her a hand, please. Dottie, you are one of our hosts, correct? Yes. Oh. Absolutely. <coughs> so Dottie, who is the uh, audience for this story? You can talk right in the microphone. A host. OK, so we have a room full of hosts. And Dottie's going to share her story. So Dottie, go ahead. I'm Dottie Burns. I am a home share provider about 10 years. My mom, Harriet, lives with me when this all started 10 years ago. My mom fell and broke her hip, was in the hospital, had the hip repa repaired, then six weeks in rehab, and then I brought her back home, at which time I needed help desperately. I had some nurses come in they did not work on my schedule, and that was not effective. So I needed, I definitely needed the help, and I had heard about Home Share, contacted them, and they put a little lady in my home, a little Japanese lady named Ryoko, who was here to study at the College Arts. She had, was a retired teacher in Japan, had raised three sons, and so I thought, this lady will qualify. 
Ryoko came and spent a year with me, a wonderful, wonderful lady. She taught me how to make some Japanese meals, and she was eager to learn how to do some American cooking. We just had a wonderful relationship. Well, Ryoko had to return back to Japan, and so I needed another lady, which Homeshir quickly provided me with. Um, this lady worked out very well also. She was with me three years. She helped me with meals, with cleaning up the kitchen, with doing the laundry. And she also helped me with my mom, who needed help with dressing and bathing, etc. Um, this lady, whose name was Joanne, she was with me for three years. We became like family. <coughs> I had four children. They all loved Joanne and hated to see her leave, but Joanne went off and did her own thing. And then Home Share replaced Joanne with another lady in my home who is with me still. They do Home Share does an excellent job of, of matching people. They interview me to see what my needs were, what my personality was, what my likes and dislikes were, what my habits were. And they also do the same with the potential guest that's going to be in my home, which is very good. When my mom died, I'm alone. The first time in my life ever was I alone and very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. Home share came to my aid again. I thought I, I wouldn't be eligible, but they said, oh yes, Dottie, you're still eligible. <laughs> want you as one of our clients. So they put a lady in my home which has become a part of my family. She's been with me almost five years. And we just have, it's, she is a real blessing. And I am more than happy with, with home share. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, you stay here. So now let's give Dottie feedback. What do we like about the story? And any ways we can make it better? Let's start with what you like. What did she do well? Yes, go ahead, Renee. Very personal. Very personal. So, so we got that, and that's always good. She, she's telling us her true story, and so we're connecting to her, and we appreciate her honesty. Yes. I really got a sense for the, the setting and what Dottie's life was like and how Home Share could, could come in to that life. Good job of saying the context. This is where the need is. Aaron. There's a lot to back up your claim as far as having a whole decade of successful Home Share. Right, right. And I wasn't even aware that, that it, there would be multiple placements. I just thought they'd make one placement, done. But here, no, I, got, I, got, I got, I got, I lost track here. There's, I got, I had three placements. The third lady was, uh, with, Joanne was the second lady. Then there's a third lady. And then when your mom died, was there a fourth? Or was that still the? No, the third lady. Is the, is the one? Yes. Okay. I had a little, was it just me? I had a little trouble tracking. You, got, you guys all followed it? So it was just me. <laughs> okay, that's right. Okay. Me and Kimberly were confused. Yes, in the back. Daddy, I really liked, I think it probably wasn't intentional, but that pause, you were kind of collecting your thoughts, and I really, because there was, you were packing in a lot in your story, and I really liked how you just had that pause moment as you thought, and it let us let a lot of it sink in. So, you know, sometimes we can think about creating that pause in our stories that lets the information and the emotions stay with us. She said that, that you paused at one point, yeah, you paused at one point telling the story, and that that actually helped in terms of conveying the emotion of the story. Yeah. So she, she appreciated that. <laughs> Good. One more comment, we'll move on. Sir. Oh, um, I, I started to lose the thread uh, just a little bit when she you started to go into the, the second placement, but then you brought it back together, and, and at the end of it, I felt like we got three stories, and then the real meaning out of that was that this is a very versatile, flexible 
sort of arrangement that has a lot of different uses you know, as you move through life courses. Yeah. And I also liked how after the second uh, segment, I guess you could say, it was only then you, you briefly like glided into the, the mechanics of like you started to talk about, oh, well, this is what the program actually does for me. But you didn't start with, this is what the mechanics right. of a, agreement set up. So you like that? Yeah, because yeah. then that was grounded to like the emotional relevance of yes. what it actually meant. Me too, me too. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's a good story and very good evidence of the success of the program. Dottie, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll you this you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a volunteer over here? Yeah. Good, come on up. You can be next. She wants to be next. Who wants? You don't want to be next. She's next. Okay. Well, after, she go after her? After her or you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's right now. Run out of books. Lee, all right, over here. Lee, uh, who is the audience for the story? We are speaking to a room full of potential hosts at a meeting at the local senior center. That's who you are. Lee has a floor. So this is Celia's story. Celia is a woman approaching 70. She lives in a big rambling house in the suburbs. And she's starting to feel like she has maybe a little too much privacy. She's got lots of space. Her room is so far from the, her bedroom is so far from the front of the house that you can't even hear the doorbell ring. And she doesn't have a dog. So she's, she's starting to feel like maybe she'd like a little company in the house. But she doesn't want too much company. She wants to make sure that her privacy is respected. So she starts by having some young people come and stay with her friends of her daughters. And one of them, at some point, the, the advantage is she thought, well, these young people, they're not going to need me. They want to want to hang out with me, you know, easy, easy peasy. One of them, however, at one point, comes and rearranges all the furniture in her living room. So that was a little off-putting about privacy. And then another one was so in her face and so there all the time that she could never get away from this person. So she realizes, I need to find a different arrangement because I, need, I don't want to be the mom. I don't want to be talking to these people all the time. I don't want them in my living room all the time. I want to just have some different kind of energy in the house and a little bit of company. So she goes to Home Share Vermont. And this is where she starts to begin to look at her ideas about boundaries and privacy. What do I really want? How do I really want to live? What are my, what are my goals? You know, do I want separate space for food in the kitchen? Well, yes, I don't want somebody eating my food. You know, do I want somebody rifling through my bills? Well, no, I don't want that. How much time do I want to spend with somebody? How much do I want to give them flexibility in using my garden and in using my living room space? So all these issues started coming up. And what's wonderful is that she found that Home Share Vermont, through this interview process, helped her really clarify the kind of living arrangement she wants and the kind of person that she wants to live with. And they found a great match for her. This woman who's been with her for three years. So great, in fact, that that woman's daughter is now also living with them. And not at all the same kind of teenager as the other ones that she had. And she's also solved the privacy issue in the winter by creating a separate um, space for her to go to. So when her guests have guests, they can hang out in the living room, and she now doesn't have to either go to her workspace or hide in her bed. She's actually created now a sitting area in her bedroom where she can go and be by herself without having the guests impinge on her space or her impinging on them. So it's turned out to be a very valuable experience. She's getting the money she needs to help afford to stay in her house, which was one of her big goals and also the company that she needed and the privacy that she really wanted. Thank you. Very good, well done. All right, stay here. So feedback, what do we like about the story? How do we make it better? What do you think? Yes. I, I like how you explain how her problem, how she addressed her problem. Up, up of, front. Of, of trying to understand the contours of what privacy really meant because it means different things to different people. You meant, so you mean when she went and sat down with Home Share Vermont and said, how do I define what I want? And then I understood that in, lar in the larger context. 
Yes. The whole thing you said about her. That was very good. Yeah. Very good. Um, one, one, one piece of advice, one, one thing you might do differently. Um, sometimes when we, when we uh, tell a story, there's, there's a thing called telling and showing. Telling is saying, one guest rearranged all the furniture. You know, well, you get that. But another way of saying that would be, well, there was this one day after she, these, two daughter, these two girls moved in, friends of her daughter, she came down to the living room, and the couch that was over there was over there. Right. And the recliner was over there. And, and her favorite rocker had been pushed into a corner. You know, in other words, just show them what happened. Don't, I mean, yes, that's rearranging the furniture, but actually let people kind of feel the experience. The more detail, the more you can just show it and let the audience figure it out for themselves, the more they're into the story. Let them figure it out. So that's just like a tiny little tweak. What else? Any other any feedback? Aaron? There's a good balance between um, uh, managing like the sort of the overall themes with some sharing a little bit of the detail and minutia that really comes up. Like what are the things that come up in how in sharing your home? And something as specific as I want my own sitting area. Yeah. And how did you how did you address that? Or how did this person address that within the context of the larger while also keeping track of the larger arc of the story? Yep. Yep. All good. Yes, back. Your voice really came through for the enthusiasm for the topic and the issue and the mission, and right. it just was so clear you cared. So it was just your voice and your delivery was very strong. The delivery too. Yes, Kimberly. I think it was really powerful for it being a home trip story, but there was also the element of you know I'm choosing to be in this tried to solve it herself first, right. and it kind of turned out for them. Right. And then she went to home care, and then I think that's when. I don't know if you heard that in the back, where Kimberly says she liked the beginning where Celia tries to solve the problem on her own and it does not work out. And that's good because that, that gets our interest. It's like, oh, you're going to try this? Oh, that failed? Oh, interesting. But then you said, by the way, but then she came to Home Share Vermont. How did she know about Home Share Vermont? That's the, when people connect with our organization, sometimes we gloss over that. Do you know? I don't know that piece of the story. That's a piece I want you, want you to go back and get, <laughs> how, how they find out. <laughs> but other than that, I think it's a really good story. Yes? Very good. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Come on up. Yeah, which for you. Thank you. All right, Greer. Greer, first introduce yourself. Where are you from? I am Greer Hamilton. I am from Buffalo, New York. Okay, and uh, who is the audience for this story? Um, potential home share programs. Like new program. Program. Oh, so that's you. You are the you audience. You are it. Okay, so yeah. you're told, told you. Okay. So I'm going to be telling the story of Marty. Marty is a Home Share Vermont volunteer, as well as she's a Home Share Vermont um, host. So, um, how many of you all lock your doors and feel comfortable like that's your preferred way of safety? Right? So, um, a lot of you all prefer to lock your doors. Um, however, Marty, our host, um, is one pr is a person who believes her community is safe enough where she doesn't have to lock our homes. However, one day she came home and learned that her um, guest prefers to lock the, the house. <laughs> and so um, Marty was locked out of her home, right? And so while um, in the host um, and guest provider agreement, um, other security and safety issues had been addressed, um, their definitions of safety did not match up. Right? And so Marty decided that she wanted to have a conversation with this guest to clearly define what it is that safety meant for both of them. And so safety and security when it comes to home sharing is not solely about um, you know, the background check and references and while that are, is very important, right? Safety and security is also about having conversations, especially difficult conversations potentially with the people that you're going to be living with. And so Marty, um, took it upon herself to engage in a conversation with her guest um, before having to return to Home Share Vermont to handle that. And so while Home Share Vermont could have been the mediator between the host and guest, um, Marty learned a key lesson that communication um, is one of the first steps in order to create a safe and secure relationship with the guest. So thank you. Very good. Okay, well done. Now you keep it. Okay, you must face your fears. That's right, David. I like that she asked a question 
as a question that most of us could relate to and probably answer in an affirmative way so that it was relatable. Right. How many of you lock your doors? So right away we're all thinking, it's like we're in the story. Right, so it's a, very, it's a good technique. Asking questions. I think we talked about that earlier. Yes, yes, Diane. So, um, so we did this as a table, as a group, but I want to say that really, we took it to a whole new level. Yeah. I mean, we had some of these elements, but she just like really went with it. How did she? So, how did she do that? that? To, to, how uh, did she? Well, we, we didn't do the question first, okay. and, and uh, we'll laugh about getting locked out. Yeah. But, but she actually made that the central part of the story, which we hadn't quite figured out yet, not to denigrate our table. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate you. You really made us look good. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Very good. What else? What other other comments? Other things we like? Yes, Kimberly, and we'll go back. You really addressed the topic in a really straightforward way, and then asked like pointed questions about it, which is got the, like that topic was there. Your talk was all about that topic. So there's no way you can miss it. Right. Like the, the safety and security message comes yeah. through loud and clear. Very good, Kirby. I was just curious whether that match is still going on. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and I, one thing I like, I just like the specificity of it. Just a day where, where you get locked out by your, by your, your guest. It's like, I mean, it's like we can all relate to that. It's a specific moment, but it speaks to such a, this larger issue of safety and security and defining what that is. Sometimes observing the small moments, you, know, you get larger lessons. So I, I particularly like that. I saw here. Lee. Yeah, I, I love the story. Um, I would have loved to hear a little bit more about what that conversation was about, some of the things that they... Okay. That's specifics. And I'm one of the 50% of people, 30% of people over age 50 who have some hearing loss. So I actually missed your first question. Uh, so I think maybe a tiny bit slower, maybe a tiny bit louder. Okay. Might help. Fair enough. My hearing aid is like, Fair enough. Wrong. <laughs> April, one more comment and we'll move on. I had a hard time uh, tying it back to why home share was important. Okay, and so it, it doesn't it doesn't speak to the basic importance, but this was this was a story just about the feelings of safety and security, and I think that's okay. Not not every not each story has to carry the burden of telling the entire program. I think the, the stories of home share home sharing are a collection of stories, and depending on who you're talking to and what their concerns are, you can pull out the right story. If an audience is unconvinced, you have the story that talks about the basic need. If, there's, if their issue is privacy, you've got a privacy story. Safety and security, you have a safety and security story. That was the narrow focus of this story. And I think that's OK. And it was two people who were planning to do a program. Yeah. So this is something right. that could come up that you want to think about when you're thinking about safety and security. Exactly. Exactly. Good. Thank you very much. This is for you. Thank you. OK, I have one more book. I have time for one more story. Sir, come on up. <laughs> All right, would you introduce yourself to the audience, please? My name is Reggie Mike, Melrose. Mike, Mike, Mike. My name is Reggie Melrose. My wife and I live in Wilson, Vermont. Closer. Closer. And we are home share. That, that better? Okay. And we're home share hosts for the last six months. Good. And so we're new with this. Good. Who is the audience you want to be telling the story to? I'm talking to a group of potential hosts. Very good. That's who you are. Reggie has the floor. Okay. And one of the issues that you're all going to be asking yourselves is this thing about compatibility. How do you know if you're going to get along with that person and that person going to get along with you? When we started this process, I had no idea what that even meant or how you're supposed to figure that out. You know, I, I could think of things I might ask somebody if you put that ad in your paper, roommate wanted or house guest wanted, and somebody comes to the door and you're talking to them, you might think of some things to ask, but nothing like what Home Share came and asked. And Amy was our representative, and she showed up with all this paperwork, and I can tell you, as I've told folks before, we haven't been grilled like this since the last time we adopted children. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't believe, when it comes to compatibility, the things they, they ask you. Now, uh, for example, do you mind if the person is, is a Republican or a Democrat or independent? Do you mind if the person smokes? Do you mind if the person drinks? Do you mind if the person owns or uses firearms? Do you mind if the person has company in your home? Do you mind if the person has an overnight guest in your home? Okay. <laughs> And I could also share from our experience that compatibility does not always involve just you as a host and a guest. What do I mean by that? We have a dog. 
The person staying with us has a cat. They had their own adjustment period. It took about two weeks. They get along fine now. But home share really does a great job in taking care of that so you don't have to be intimidated by it. And you don't have to feel as though you have to now be responsible for entertaining this guest that's in your house. And they don't have to feel like they are responsible walking on pins and needles in your property. Now, compatibility isn't just that. Compatibility is also something in yourself because all of a sudden now, you've been in a home where you're used to having access to the whole house. Even if you don't use it all, you're used to having access to it. Now all of a sudden, you can't because there's somebody else in this space. You can't just walk in that room anymore. That takes an adjustment too, but they're very good about following up to uh, keep you in line and also the other person. So it does all work out. Thank you. Right, stay here, stay here, keep the mic. Same two questions. What do you like about Reggie's story? Any ways to make it even better? What do you think? There's some good stuff in there. You got, I heard some laughs. <laughs> what would you like, Aaron? I, li I liked your enthusiasm. Uh, you know, you used a lot of tone in your voice. Yep. Uh, you used a sound effect. You were sort of illiterate with your, uh, with your movements. Yeah, so this enthusiastic, the energy of delivery helped to sell the story. So that's, that's absolutely a good point. Ray? The pet issue, I have pet chocolate labs. I'm a host. I said, they're under your feet all the time. You can love pets, but you got to know when you turn directions in the kitchen, you're going to step on them, or they're going to trick you. Right, right, right. And it's worked out well. Okay. Uh, I can leave the house, not worry about feeding them at feeding time, because yeah. she loves them. That's great. That's great. So that's, that's an issue. Lee? I love the humor. I think that's so important, because it's such a serious issue, and we're so serious about it, and just being able to speak from your personal experience and put that humor in it makes it so much more relatable. Humor helps. We talk about connecting people on an emotional level. Humor is kind of the, 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 the go-to because if you can make people laugh, it's, it, sort of, it sets them at ease and, and they, they open up and connect. And Sydney did that very well. So thank you for highlighting that. Kimberly. You used some uh, descriptions for you know, how people were feeling in the moment and those like, I was like visualizing those, or like the pins and needles. Like I'm like, oh, visualizing the pins and needles. Yep. So that really helped you know, bring me emotionally. So the good visual details. Good. Anything else? Yes. Go ahead. I liked the the explanation you had of how home share fit into solving this problem for you guys, and you chose do you mind questions that were really different, and I got a sense. Oh wow, they're really looking at the big picture. Yeah, the specificity of the questions was really good. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think it's a very good story. Diane, last comment. I, I like that there was sort of an amazement in your voice, like that this actually worked. And that, <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. that was just really fun for me to hear that, that kind of amazement. Like, oh, okay, this could really work. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I think it's a good story. It was also really clear about what compatibility yes. meant. So the shared meaning, I think, was also you know, part of what made the story strong and relatable. Very good. Reggie, thank you very much. It's for you. Thank you. So we only have 10 minutes left, and I do want to throw it open for any questions or comments. We talked about three things today. First, we talked about why storytelling is important, how it helps us remember, and can influence how we think and behave, actually change how people think and behave. We talked about how to tell a good story, and you saw the basic structure of the three-act story that you guys all do instinctively anyway. And then we talked about the kinds of stories you should tell and the three categories, and you've seen some great examples there. Any lingering questions, comments, concerns? Lee? I have a question um, about the difference between telling a story and writing a story. Yes. So this whole collection of stories I'm thinking would make a great series of articles in a newspaper or even a you know, column that you yep. have monthly, the home sharing column. Yep. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah. The, uh, you know, my philosophy on stories is, first of all, you have to gather the raw material. It's like mining gold. It's like bring back the, the gold nuggets from out there in the world, the real stories of hosts and guests. Once you bring them back, you're going to pound them into different shapes. If a story is to be told on your website, for example, video is your best friend. People will click on and watch a two or three minute video much more often than they're going to sit and read 500 words off a screen. If you're printing and sending out a newsletter or a brochure, then a, a printed story is fine. And if you can accompany it with pictures, pictures can carry a lot of the burden of describing the people and the places, et cetera. Uh, but if it's just words, either on paper 
or coming out of your mouth, then it's incumbent on you to be as visual and specific as possible because you want to conjure the people, the places, the feelings. So same story told differently in different ways. Good question. Other questions, Aaron? Uh, um, I'm wondering, uh, from the perspective of someone trying to start a program, yes. <clears throat> what tips you would have for garnering support in that community when there's no like experiential, there's no stories from that community yet to share? Uh, Kirby, I'm going to, to defer to you. Is this something, he, you heard the question about starting a program? Is this something you're going to get into later? Because this, this, I think it's above my pay grade. No, we're going to be talking a little bit more about marketing later. OK, I'm going to leave it at that. I mean, stories, I think, are a very important part of all marketing communication. But I think you'll, you'll get into those details. And I think we, you can use other people's stories uh, yes. from other areas or other places. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Um, I just have a question. If you're talking to a larger group or a smaller group and like interactivity, or is there a way I don't know, to think about telling stories based on the size of the group. Like, let's say you have a small group or one person. Maybe you don't want to talk at them. Or right. Well, I mean, I mean, stories, to me, stories are kind of an all-purpose tool. You know, you tell stories in your own life. You tell stories to individuals. You'll tell stories to a dinner table full of people. You might tell stories to a room full of people. It doesn't really change that much. Um, I, I think in terms of when you're making a presentation, if you're actually doing a formal presentation with slides and stuff like that, if it's a very small group at a table, to like stand up with a big screen like that would be very awkward, right? So you want to be more intimate in that setting. But stories, I think, you know, they think they travel well. I think you're okay. Let me give you some resources. Um, I do a monthly newsletter that's only about best practices in communications in the public interest world in which we all live and work. It's called Free Range Thinking. If you go to my website, thegoodmancenter.com, if, if today has interested you, if you think you're interested in these topics, Go to our website, give us your email address. We'll send this to you once a month. No cost, charge, or obligation, as they say on TV. Um, and uh, we won't do anything else with your email address. You just get this. We won't spam you with anything else. Um, I also wrote two books, which you might find useful, Why Bad Ads Happen to Good Causes, uh, and the stunning sequel, Why Bad Presentations Happen to Good Causes. Both of these books were uh, generously underwritten by foundations. So if either title interests you, again, you can go to our website, go to the resources section, download either one for free. And um, I highly recommend this website, ethicalstorytelling.com. Um, more and more as we tell stories of other people or they give us permission to use their stories, we want to make sure that we're not abusing that privilege. So if you go to this website, it'll talk about how to make sure you tell stories in an ethical way but there's one uh, tool on this website that I want to highlight. It's a, it says media consent form, but it's basically a, a consent form for using someone else's story to make sure that, that they are giving you what we call deep consent, <laughs> that they truly understand what they're allowing you to do with their story, where and for how long. I'll blow it up for you a little bit. Um, I understand that my story is my own, but I grant permission to do these various things. Um, my image is used without being obscured. My image is obscured. My real name can be used. Real specifics about how they're going to be identified. Where it's going to be used, one time only, for a month, for a year, etc., <coughs> and any other conditions of, of use. This form is not perfect, but it's a great start to make sure that the person is really <laughs> fully informed on how you're using their story. So again, ethicalstorytelling.com, if you're going to use other people's stories, Give them a visit. It's just a wonderful site, lots of good resources. Is it, yes. Could you tell about last night you told about how things can be out on the web? Oh, yeah. There, there was one, one of the examples, I think it's on the website, was somebody had um, been a, uh, a, I think it was a drug addict, had been, been using drugs and had gone to an organization that had helped them kick and, and get back into society. And that story was being used on their website and on YouTube, and this person ends up going to a job interview, and naturally, they, you know, now job interviews, they Google your name and stuff, and the person was confronted and said, well, I understand you had trouble with drugs. And it was like, well, yeah, that was years ago. I'm well past that, but you see a video, you know, it looks like that was yesterday, right? So that's the kind of ethical issues we're talking about. Um, in between newsletters, if something breaks and it's like, oh, you should, Go watch this, uh, this newscast or check out this website or you've got to read this report. I'll tweet under the name Goodman Center. So if you follow people on Twitter and you want to be up on communications issues, 
at Goodman Center is my handle there. Um, there were many, many details for this morning to go as smoothly as it did, for everything to work out. These are the organizations that are responsible. Can we have a moment of, of thanks for them? Thank you. And my last thought before I turn it back to Kirby for the rest of the day, if you remember nothing else from this morning, I hope you remember this. In the long run, if you're trying to connect with people, change how they think and behave, numbers are important, but numbers by themselves tend to numb. Look, it's right there in the word. <laughs> And all that jargon we use, it just jars. And nobody ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Stories are different. Stories, by their very nature, tend to get stored in our brains. So if you can change the story inside someone's head, you've taken the first step to changing the world. And if you will do that, then I say, I'm comfortable closing the curtain on today's workshop, but this is definitely not the end. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.